Ah, uh, that's Jenny. But that's not Jenny's dad. If she gets into that car, you may be looking at Jenny for the last time. I'm McGruff, the crime dog. Let me show you something. See that playground? A lot of kids there. Every day in this country, 60 kids disappear. Some run away, but a lot are kidnapped by strangers or even by people they know. Almost 20,000 kids a year. 20,000 kids, one kid at a time. Maybe your kid on your street, just like Jenny. You know, your kids can learn to protect themselves against crime at home, at school, on the street. Very nice going, Jenny. She's going to tell her folks about this. And you can write them a gruff. Learn how to keep your family and your community safe and help uh, take a bite out of crime. <laughs> What a roller coaster of a movie. But in a good way. So let's start this off because originally we were going to do Elvis, but as we were walking out of Lightyear, you saw the poster to Black Phone. And you're like, oh, that Ethan Hawke movie. And you're like, you know, I've been hearing good things about it. I'll take a shot, listen to you, take a gamble, go and see it. Thank fuck I did. Yeah, that was really, really good. Oh, yes. This is a summer movie. So many emotions, so much action. It's... Where do we begin? Where do we begin? Well, for starters, um, it's a horror movie. Well, no, it's, it's, like, it's kind of like a thriller. Maybe not a horror movie, but it does have some... Hmm elements that might be disturbing yeah it's not over the top with the gore though no. it you know it uses it when it's appropriate it it escalates like an in, intense thriller the best way to describe the tone is last year when some friends of mine did a live stream we did a whole month dedicated to movies that Cisco and ebert dubbed dog of the week um i can see this kind of being a movie that was just it came out some critics didn't like it, but over time it gets some kind of appraisal for some strange thing, like how The Hand by Oliver Stone, this psychological thriller about Michael Caine, that's this artist who gets his own hand cut off, and the hand that gets cut off is like evil and stuff and is killing people, but the big twist is that it's so psychological you don't know if his hand is really possessed or he's doing the murders. Like that kind of thing, where it's a really set up well-paid premise like some kind of slasher movie or some urban legend that's so slickly done forgotten and then years later through home video or television it's brought up again it gets reevaluated, and people see it as some kind of modern day cult classic that is that kind of movie to me in a sense it was this low budget slickly made feature that has its writing in the heart place the effort all there it's somehow forgotten, and then it's rediscovered. But upon rediscovery, it's like, you know, there's some things about it that are actually pretty good. Like how slash movies like Friday the 13th, in a sense, how they're disregarded as basic trash, but then over time, it's like, no, there's elements here that are kind of interesting and revolutionary, and how they pave the way for other horror movies we would get. Really good ones. So I would put it on the long lines of that. It's a very well-made, slickly crafted feature film. I was on the edge of my seat. I was literally on the edge of my seat. I can't remember the last time I've seen a horror movie that had this emotional beats, well-developed characters. It plays you for a loop so much. One minute you hate this character, and then later you see that there's a reason why he's acting like this, or why this person's acting like this. I. I'm at a loss for words. I'm honestly at a loss for words. This is the kind of movie I usually search every year for, where every where its heart is in the right place. And it doesn't do hotly at the box office, but it does later over time. These are the kinds of movies I often say at the end of the year, this is the must-see, like Kubo and the Two Strings, or um, the Holex documentary that someone did on YouTube last, uh, two years ago. 
like when I say see this movie, see this movie, and this is one of those movies you gotta see, especially in a theater. Yes, yes, it was. Um, it made me think of it a little bit. It is. Well, uh, I was telling this to you earlier. It's based off a short story written by the son of Stephen King. Okay. okay. Well, he even looks yeah. like him too, yeah. which is so creepy. You can definitely see where, like father, like son. Fig literally. <laughs> yeah. Not just figuratively. Yeah. Literally. It, it definitely made me think of a of a Stephen King story, mm. and it, it it was just really really good. Like, Ooh. I saw the trailer for this a while back with my sister, and we were interested in it. So when I saw the poster last week, I'm like, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> so I'm glad that you agreed to watch it. I did. I did. Because I had a hunch. I First it was you. Then I saw how it was being um, critically analyzed. There were some good notes. I thought, you know, might as well go with like a little quick slick flick. Because the past couple of weeks have been kind of hit and miss. I'm just glad that I saw a good summer flick. Yeah. A legit good summer flick. Okay, so it's set in 1978. Great, smart, perfect. I like how they limit the technology. I like how it's this little time capsule film, like Super 8 in a sense. Uh, the the main character kid, I liked his character arc and how Vinny, you feel so bad because you know he's the outsider in school, all these things going around, kids are disappearing. Um, he gets kidnapped by this part-time magician, demented serial killer, played by Ethan Hawke, called The Grabber. Fucking creepy as hell, man. Yeah. Fucking creepy yeah. as hell. And he, he's in this basement for most of the time, trying to figure out how to escape. There's a black phone right next to him, and every time it rings, he picks it up, and he hears the voice of one of the victims that The Grabber killed, and they're telling him, you know, be on the lookout for this, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, giving instructions on how to either escape or do something else. I can't spoil it because it actually is a pretty good payoff. I was like on the edge of my seat the whole time. Just the acting, the premise just kept me intriguing. I wanted to see where it would go. That is the successful modes of a movie. You want the movie to act upon you, not, you know, I'm just at a loss for words. Yeah, it, it was... I'm really at a loss for words. It was really well done. Everything just played out just fine. Uh, what stand out to you the most in this film? Um, well, the atmosphere, I would say. Okay. The atmosphere, I would say. <laughs> they agree, anyway. It had a good atmosphere. It ha I love the atmosphere of this one. I mean, normally when you're stuck in this one... Well, you're not really stuck in this one area, but for a majority of the movie, I'd say, like... 40 to 60 percent you're in like this really grungy looking basement kind of area um and this kid's like looking around and stuff and usually something like that would be boring no they make it interesting because he's exploring he's picking apart pieces of like uh, the floorboards furniture trying to find items to use that get used later on um looking around for like escape hatches and things like that it's just so interesting. Normally they'd make it boring, but just the camera angles and the way they use the environment to their advantage were really, really clever. The scenes when he's talking on the phone to the dead character, and you can kind of see off to the side, like, the spirit of the soul of the kid just talking right next to him and how they distort the voice so it sounds like their voice is coming out of the phone. That is really clever stuff. Yeah. It, it, like, it, it's either the actual ghost of the kid or it's playing in his mind, like he's trying to remember the person and their name. That is really, really ingenious stuff. Yeah. Just the, the cinematography and everything. Uh, what did you think of the Vinny's father? Because for a while, they really plagued with the fact that he's this really hateful person, but then they reveal some information later on. Well, I wouldn't say he was a hateful person. It's obvious that he had issues. A complex. And also character. back then, they were more yeah. fine about beating children. <laughs> that definitely, well, up in this area anyway, that wouldn't fly today. Can't really say the same about down south, but... True, true. I do love how that gets resolved later on. Yeah. Like, you do understand that, no, he's traumatic, he's 
like that because oh, of what like happened it, to his it, wife. wife. Yeah, and how that plays out in the end. I thought so was... him getting mad at the daughter later on, you can understand. It's like he doesn't want her to go down the same path mm -hmm. as her mother. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Ethan Hawke as the grabber? He was really good. Oh. He was really creepy. Like, that, very, very oh. creepy. Him and Brad Dorf in Exorcist 3 are so equally creepy. Maybe Brad Dorf by a hair. Um, not going into too much detail because I don't want to ruin too much of Exorcist 3, but there's a scene in Exorcist 3 where Brad Dorf is breaking down just how he kills the victim. And it's so sinister and eerie. You just feel your blood boil at how he's depicting the murders. This is almost effective because you don't know what is going to happen. He comes in, he has like the interchangeable face masks and things like that, the way he's toying with the kid and you just, he's like an animal loose in the house. This is a pure predator and you don't know what he's going to do. And that is the essence of a good villain and bad guy. You just don't know what he's going to do upon this character and you're infascinated, intrigued, and scared at the same time. I was like, literally on the edge of my seat. It was just that creepy. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the stuff with uh, Vinny's sister and the psychological... Um, well, that, that she has it's like these visions and Yeah, that's, that's the thing that really made me think of Stephen mm. King. That, and I thought that was interesting how... Yeah. She was the one that was... Seeing the vision. Yeah, like, she helped solve the case. Like, she didn't necessarily save her brother, but she did lead the police to where, well, you know... We where don't they wanna, find stuff. Yeah, where they find stuff. So we, don't wanna, we don't want to say too that much. That was good. That yeah. was good, because I thought it was going in one direction, and it's revealed something else, which is also pretty crucial, too. And the minute I saw that, I put two together in my mind going, oh, my God. They could, if this was done poorly, this would have been like so ridiculous, but given the time period and how it's set, it makes so much sense where it leads to in yeah. regards to the location of the victims and things like that. Uh, but without giving too much away, I thought that was actually a very good twist. Yes. Just where it was going. It's like these visions, what do they mean? And when you see where they add up, you take a step back and think, no, it does make sense where it's going. The kids are communicating Vinny to prepare for this kind of thing, or else the other kids are communicating to the girl for another purpose. Yes. This was just... I'm actually floored. This is very floored. And even some of the minor characters, too, got a good chuckle, like Max, and how he's like trying to be like the neighborhood watch person. I can hook yeah. up with you. I, I can connect the I dots. Like, I like so, Max. I know like his part is very small, like three or five minutes, but there's something so effective about it. Just yeah. the way he interacts with the police characters. And he has like that whole big board of like little mur murders and news clippings. Yeah. I like stuff like that. The 1978 tinge. I like the convenience store with the star log movie magazines. Just little things like that just do add to the environment in a sense. But I, gotta, I do have to knock off some points because I don't know if this is true. There's a shot in the movie where you see um, at the convenience store there's like certain candies and stuff, which would exist, like lip nicks and stuff. But on the uh, dispensary boxes, you see the nutrition facts. I don't think those existed back in the 1970s, so I gotta take off some points, but I can forgive it because this is a very slickly made, well done movie, and I'm, I'm glad you chose this one. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh. What was that? Uh, just people being people. Of course. So, yes, next time it should be Elvis. Oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Uh -huh. it's, it's Elvis. I'm telling you, it's Elvis. It's Elvis. All right, well, thank until. You. Thank you for Black Phone. You're welcome, dear. Speaking of which, uh, we only got two trailers for this one. Uh, one was Bullet Train, which looks fun. Yeah. Not my cup of tea, but... Okay. Yeah. I mean, for a fast-paced action thriller, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Mm. I want to see where that kind of goes. You got the, yeah. uh, the lead carrying the briefcase of information. All these assassins are going at him in this, like, fast-moving Japan... I don't know, it kind of hit me in the right way because I love stuff like that where it's just a high concept film on like a low base energy thing. <laughs> it could work. Yeah. What was the other trailer? Um, this one I can agree with you because when I saw it play, I'm like, oh, it's this kind of thing. 
It's David, oh, yes. David Cronenberg's yes. Crimes of the Future. I, yeah, I, I already know uh, what happens in that because I watched Amanda the Jedi's video. Yeah. I'm definitely not watching that. It's, it's, uh, definitely not. David Cronenberg's hit and miss. There, there's some of his movies that I think you'd be okay with, like, Scanners, because it's not too much bodily horror in, in a sense. Um, the Fly remake, I don't know if you'd be safe with that one because of what happens to Jeff Goldblum's character. Oh, I've, I've been spoiled on that. Insects don't have politics. I could be the first insect politician. <laughs> um, no. Like, I'm not a huge David Cronenberg person, but oh, some of his movies are like, okay, I'm okay with this, but Rabbit's the one where I'm like, this is so damn stupid. <laughs> it's... Rabid, R-A-B-I-D. It's a Canadian horror film where a woman gets a blood transfusion, but the blood that she gets is infected. I would love to see a reaction to this. Oh, boy. The blood transfusion causes her body to mutate. So, she ends up getting a pair of stingers in her armpits. And when she makes love to someone, the stingers come out and kill said person and turns them into an infected zombie-like thing and it causes a weird pandemic. Like... That's like, how stupid... That's, like, that bee stingers? I, like, scorpion stingers. Why the armpits? It would make more sense if it was her hands. The mm. armpits? Yep. That's like the most obscure yep. spot. That would be like... Having it be her eyeballs or something. And this was made in the 80s, so... Yeah. I mean, they've made horror movies about... Vaginas biting off penises, so I guess this shouldn't surprise me, but... Still, yeah. in the armpit? That's, that's where I stop. Uh, poison blood transfusion? Yeah, yeah. Stingers in the armpits? Well, that's where I stop. Yeah, because it's just nonsensical. Yeah. I... I, I don't know, some people like that movie that's just like no I, I can't get past armpit stingers uh, still there's always piranha women who have teeth on their nipples and it is not directed by David Cronenberg but Fred oh, teeth on their nipples <laughs> I would imagine that would get really annoying I have to get a new bra because my stupid nipples keep chewing on my boot and my <laughs> shirts and my bras. And I had a customer complain today because my nipples were barking at him. Buddy, can you pass the neosporin? Your nipples bit me again. I... Who wants a biscuit? He's a good I'll, I'll, I'll give it this. I'll give it this much. It's a two-part serial thing. Episode one, not bad so far. It does have the pace of a lifetime kind of drama in a sense, but I don't know. The CGI in those things like, is like hit and miss for me. Mm. But the fangs, I can get behind. <laughs> no, 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 in the mouth. Okay. The, the makeup work on the mouth, I can get behind, but the CGI, blip, 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 blip. That's, that's why I'm like, don't know how to feel about that, honey. So there you go. Demented black phones, creepy basement Ethan Hawk street magicians that are party for hire Cronenberg movies that are bizarrely bodily horror and piranha lip nipples there's your vlog for today kids yes Tune next in. week it will be brought to you by the letter G and 42 yes it will be Elvis alright till next time everyone later everybody Ooh. Their water bottle, their water bottle, they left it on the... Oh! Oh, it landed inside the car, so... Oh, man, I wish I caught that on camera. That would have been so cool. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, the camera's still rolling, isn't it? Yeah, so we're commentating on it, so at least we can say it happened. Yeah, it happened. They had their water <laughs> bottle on the top of their car. <laughs> so, yeah. And there wasn't any creepy woman sta walking by staring at us this time. <laughs> Oh, maybe, no, they're too far away. Yeah, maybe I should play that back just to see if there are any creepy people. Well, I don't know if you could catch her on the camera. It was more like she was walking in front, and, like, she was kind of staring at us like that, and then, like, 
She was kind of, it looked like she was trying to look into the car from your side, and I'm like, lady, go away. We're recording something. <laughs> I don't know, maybe the lighting blocked it, but there you go. Yeah. Remember, Mothers of America, don't hire magicians for birthday parties. Hire no. puppet people. And stay away from people that have masks that look like it's from The Purge. Or ones that are created by Tom Savini. <laughs> Later.